to talk with us about to talk with us about a path to machine learning and a path to reproductible, scalable, and trustworthy science. And um, Michael is going to introduce her in a few minutes. So Emily, um, the New Mexico Technology Council and um, is a membership a membership led organization committed to supporting our tech ecosystems by providing networking. Hopefully, I think we're pretty close to be able to providing that networking in person, um, programming, professional development such as this, um, public policy adv advocacy, supporting STEM um, education and broadband development, that kind of thing, and workforce development initiatives. Um, we have our monthly peer groups such as this, um, our signature events, our Women in Technology Awards and Experience IT Conference that um, we will be having this fall. And as I mentioned, policy advocacy during the legislative session and weekly updates and then member promotion and features. And so if you're interested in being a member, please reach out to Mary Tiemann. And our next slide. So we're so fortunate to have such a wonderful group of companies and community partners that support our organization. And here you can see a screenshot of a lot of those really across industry sectors. So thank you so much always to our community partners and our members for supporting our organization <clears throat> and our program of work. So we have a number of upcoming events just to keep an eye on. You can always go to our website and take a look at those. Women in 3D printing is Wednesday. The city of Albuquerque is doing a data fest um, June 19th. And we're gonna also be doing an, an Air Force Research Labs virtual tour. tour. And then our, work, our WIT uh, virtual happy hour. We're not sure if that one will be virtual or in person. We were thinking it would be so nice to be able to do something outside, but now we're gonna to have to think about that 100 degree weather. So um, please take a look at our website and you can see, um, you can take a look at all of our events that are, are coming up. And if you have an event to share with us, please let us know. We're always happy to promote our member activities. And we want to thank all of our Women in Technology Award sponsors that continue to support us and uh, sponsored our honorees and supported our event. You can go to our website if you didn't have the opportunity to watch it. We recognized seven really outstanding women in technology. And um, so there's a great, <clears throat> you can see the full video and um, it's just a great event and some great recognition of um, the women who, who we recognize this year and who are our honorees. Michael Maestas is our chair of the um, Big Data and AI Peer Group Committee. So um, Michael with Sage Core, Core Technologies, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Deborah, and thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, we have a wonderful uh, guest speaker here today. Uh, Trilce Estrada is an associate professor with the Department of Computer Science at the University of New Mexico and the director of Data Science Laboratory. Her research interests span the intersection of machine learning, high performance computing, big data and their applications to interdisciplinary problems in science and medicine. Estrada received an NSF Career Award for her work in in situ uh, analysis distribution machine learning. In 2019, she was named the ACM uh, SIG HPC Emerging Woman Leader in Technical Computing. She is the big data aspect lead for the N. F NSF TCPP National Curriculum Development Initiative that seeks to include and promote the adoption of parallel processing in the undergraduate curriculum. She is the PI Faculty Advisor of New Mexico's Critical Technology Studies Program, a multi-institutional consortium for the development of human expertise for the intelligence community. Estrada obtained a PhD in computer science from the University of Delaware 
an MS in computer science from Inaho, Mexico, and a BS in informatics from the, uh, forgive me for mispronouncing this, Universe of, Universe of Guadalajara, Mexico. So I apologize for mispronouncing that. And with that, I'd love to turn the floor over to Trilce and uh, we look forward to this wonderful talk. Thank you, Michael. And sorry for so many acronyms. I should have known better for that. Okay, so it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm Associate Professor at the University of New Mexico here in the Department of Computer Science. And I'm going to be talking to you about AI. So you have been hearing probably a lot, a lot about AI lately. In the past five years, AI and specifically machine learning and neural networks have been taking over every industry, every field in, in science, in commerce, in every aspect of the life of, um, of our lives. So maybe you have even heard people saying that AI is going to take over the world. Well, I don't think we are there yet, or are we? In 2019, AI, uh, OpenAI came, uh, made headlines with this particular, uh, this particular notion. They say AI text generator too dangerous to release their creators. So they were talking about GPT-2. It, it was a transformer type uh, neural network uh, that consisted of 1.5 billion parameters. It was trained with 8 million pages. And they say it was so good that people were not going to be able to differentiate uh, text that was generated by humans versus text that was generated by the AI. So they thought it was too dangerous. We are not going to release it. We are going to release only a small version of this very dangerous AI. That was in 2019. In, uh, at the beginning of, of last year, Microsoft released a 17 billion parameter model. So we go from 1.5, that was already too dangerous to be released to the public, to 17 billion parameters. Then uh, OpenAI released GPT-3. It has 175 billion parameters. If you were going to use a Tesla V100, for example, it will require 355 years to train and over $4, millions, uh, $4 million. In reality, they use more complex uh, hardware and it took over $12 million to train. And then just recently in April, Google announced that the researchers were able to train a language model containing 1.6 trillion parameters. So you can see the order of magnitude of the scale at which AI is growing. So in less than a decade, we went from 60 million to 1.6 trillion parameters. You can see the graph over here of the exponential growth that we are seeing, especially in the modern era of deep learning models. So the compute need grows exponentially, the number of parameters grows exponentially. And um, the problem is that the models are growing larger and more complex. They require huge data sets and massive computing needs to ma that make replication very expensive, if not impossible. So basically they come up with these models and then nobody else can replicate. You cannot understand a model with 1.6 trillion parameters. It's just humanly impossible. So if we look at the spectrum of innovation, we see big companies like Facebook, Google, Microsoft, all over here in this end of the spectrum, where they are saying, we're going to just build bigger and bigger. It doesn't matter what else is to the model as long as it works. Right, so that's what they are trying to say. So build bigger and bigger, and we, they, they have the money and they have the resources to do that. The other side of the coin is this. These are headlines that I just grabbed from the internet uh, of, of the use of machine learning in, in our days. So you can see something like this. Try neural networks, learn how to in 11 lines of code, or build your own image classifier in less time that it takes to bake a pizza. This one went a little further. Build a neural net in four minutes. So that's the other end of the spectrum, where the users 
they really just don't care what these models are doing. They just say, okay, download the tutorial, use it, deploy it, and think later. We don't even really care about what those models are doing or how they are doing it, what are their challenges, what are their needs. So this is the two spectrum of the innovation at this point in time. We think we need to stay kind of here in the middle. We cannot go for bigger and bigger models because once we don't have the type of uh, millions and millions of uh, resources that you need to deploy those, but also because by becoming larger, they are harder to understand and to trust. Let's imagine a function. And so in, if you were going to use, uh, for example, a polynomial linear regression to fit a function like this, you will come up with a polynomial that will kind of adapt to this shape, right? Neural networks don't need to learn the whole model. Neural networks are what is known as composable functions. You have seen this diagram of a neural network, um, probably, where you can observe that we have layers of units. Each one of these are layers. And each one of those units are really just functions. All of these inputs to the unit are parameters. So when I was talking about those 1.6 trillion parameters, I'm referring to all those little connections. So you can imagine how big this becomes. And all of this forms one function. And then this function becomes the input to another function in the next layer and so on. So that's how they start composing functions. And this is a problem because neural networks are universal function approximators. They can approximate basically any function that you give them. They do it very easily. Instead of learning the whole function, they start learning little by little. Like you can see one little path, maybe this part of the function, another path, maybe this part of the function, another path is over here. Eventually, they start learning many of those until they learn all of the functions that there is to learn. Now, the problem is you don't know if those neural networks are learning the features of a hat or the features of an elephant. They are black boxes at the end of the day. There is a urban legend that is um, very famous in our fields, and I'm going to tell you this. this there is no proof that this was even real. But it's, it's a good example of uh, what may happen with neural networks. So once upon a time, the US Army wanted to use neural networks to automatically detect camouflage enemy, enemy tanks. And they, this was in the 90s. They collected 200 images of tanks. 100 were images with tanks in the figure, and 100 were with no tanks in the image. They use half of the data set to train a model to try to detect tank versus no tank in the images. And then they use the other uh, half of the data set to validate the model. So when they validated, they got an accuracy that was very, very high. And so they were very happy because they did what you're supposed to do with, with uh, machine learning models, right? You train with part of the data and then you validate with other part of the data to make sure that they generalize. Now, when they sent this model to the Pentagon, the system didn't work. Nothing worked. So the high accuracies that they observed in the lab, they were not maintained in the real world. And that's because what they say is, well, the system was really learning to detect night versus day. It turned out that the images with tanks were taking during the night or in dark conditions, the pictures with no tanks were taking during the day. So what I'm trying to illustrate to you is, yes, neural networks can approximate any function, but many times you don't have a lot of control on what that function is. They may be learning their own thing without you really knowing. So the complexity that gives extraordinary predictive power to these black box models, they also make them very difficult to understand and trust. So a model can achieve very high accuracy by memorizing the unimportant features or patterns in the data set, and that's a problem. OK, so in this talk, really, I'm going to talk to you about how do we inject uh, AI in the scientific workflow. This is, this is important because we are not talking about applications like figuring out the ratings of Netflix, right? You can give three stars or four stars. You don't really care how it works as long as it works. You don't really care if one time was three stars and next time was five stars. The problem is not that sensitive. But when we're speaking about medical or scientific applications, 
reproducibility of findings is a key core of science. If you cannot reproduce re your results, you cannot trust them. Trust is another very important issue. You, you cannot go to a medical doctor and tell them, just use my black box and you're going to be fine, right? They want to know that if there is the life of somebody on the line, that they can trust the models. So I'm going to be talking about three challenges and needs for AI that are scalability, reproducibility, and trust in the context of medical and scientific applications. So I'm going to give you three examples if I have time. I have my clock over here making sure I don't go over time. But um, it's kind of going to be high level. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to go more in detail uh, during the question uh, part of the talk. The first challenge that I'm going to be talking about is reproducibility. Yeah, and it's basically on the obsession with clean data and the effects of sampling bias. This is work by my student, uh, Jeremy Benson. He did that while working at Vision Quest Biomedical. Um, and it's about teleretinal screening. So in teleretinal screening, what you have is you have uh, in many places, in many countries, you don't have doctors that can analyze a retinal image and tell you exactly what that patient has. So what happens in these situations is that you outsource the analysis of those images to the computer. So you may have some technicians taking these pictures and you may have very high-end cameras like this one, or you might have uh, handheld devices like this one, where the quality of the devices is going to vary a lot and the abilities of the technicians also is going to vary a lot. So this is the context of the problem that I'm going to show you in, in a second. But before going into the awesome research that um, Jeremy is doing, I want to first give you a cautionary tale. Uh, he started his work in around 2016, and around that time, there was this paper coming up uh, by Google Research, and it's the development and validation of a deep learning algorithm for detection of diabetic retinopathy in retinal fundus photographs, all of that. And I remember his face of terror because it was like they came up with very high sensitivity and specificity numbers. It was like he was starting on this problem and there comes Google already solving it. Was it is this problem already then solved if they are coming with these high, high numbers? So you can see this is an extract of the paper and they, they, they basically highlight how high sensitivity and specificity for detecting referral, referable diabetic retinopathy, they were getting numbers in the range of 90 to 98% for sensitivity and specificity. So it was like a big blow. This is a figure from that paper. And so there, there was something that uh, he noticed right away. So if you look at the way in which they were dealing with data, um, they were excluding a lot of data in, in, in through their process. So you can see 17 excluded, 158 ex excluded, some more excluded over here. So they were trying to come up with a data that was a data set that was very clean, very high quality to train their algorithm, which of course, as data scientists, we know we want clean data, we want to have high, high quality data training uh, our systems with. But this was still very fishy that they were removing so much data from their system and they were just doing uh, predictions on, on cases that were very clean. Now, the moral in 2020, Google Research again came up with the validation for that paper, but now they call it a human center evaluation that was actually deployed in clinics for the same problem. In the paper, you can see things like this. We, sus uh, we suspected even us using a high quality data set to train the deep learning model that environmental and contextual factors will impact the system performance in a clinical setting. Yeah, of course, I mean, they were training with very high quality data, but then what happens is when they deploy in the real world, in real clinics, this didn't work. This didn't work as well, because of course there are many factors that were not accounted in that data set. So yeah, we want clean data. It's probably in all of our collecting collective dreams, but that's not how the world works. So when Jeremy started working in this problem, 
he made a very conscious decision from the very beginning to take data that was not completely clean, to use data that had defects, like, for example, crescents and shadows, and defects that came from the camera and from the technician, and so that the model was going to be able to identify when something was a problem with the image and when something was actual disease. So he did that. Then he came up with a very clever way of uh, standardizing their images so that it didn't matter what type of camera they were using. He was able to still put the data features in the same feature space and come up with a, with a good prediction on whether that there was disease or not disease in the eye. Uh, so using this technique, he was able to standardize images like this, like with different resolutions, with different camera uh, aspect ratios into something that was very similar now for the algorithm to train. And again, he did not, he, he tried to not discard data at all. Um, at the end, he got very, very good results that are comparable to what FDA uses for approval for this type of devices. And as of May of 2021, Vision Quest has processed over 40,000 cases in 13 countries in America and Africa. So they are able to deploy this system in the real world, in real clinics, and it's working great. So the key takeaway for this is that that data is not always evil. We all want pristine data, but if you really want your model to be deployed in the real world and to work there well, it has to be trained with a realistic view of the problem. Otherwise, it will have what is called sampling bias. Sampling bias is when you train your models with just a fraction of the distribution of what they are going to see in real life. And then when you try to deploy them, they just don't work. So that's the first case that I wanted to show you. Second case is going to be on scalability, and I'm just making sure I'm OK with the time. Uh, this is work by my student, Hector Carrillo Cavada, now working at Intuit, and Harshita Sani. She's one of my new students. And I'm going to show you how data representation enables scalable and explainable AI. At the end of the day, we want to be able to scale. We want to be able to use these med models. But if we are dealing with scientists, we need to be able to explain to them why our models is um, predicting what they are predicting. Probably many of you have heard something like this. Um, just give all the data to your model, and the model will learn the, the features that they need to learn so that it works. I have heard that from a lot of people that should know better. And the thing is, that may be true for very big systems, like what Google and Facebook and LinkedIn are working with. Yes, if you have millions and millions of um, data points and you have a lot of compute power, yeah, probably they are going to be able to learn the salient features that are going to be relevant for your problem and go are going to be able to learn. But if you are at a smaller scale, as most of us are, we don't have the amount of data or the amount of compute to make this thing true. We need to still pay attention to how we represent the data. How do we extract information so that the models can be built in a way that they really learn and they don't just overfit, as I was showing you before, to a hat or an elephant, but they actually learn the type of function that you want them to learn. This next example is going to be in the context of proteins. So proteins, they are basically like a very big chain of amino acids. You can see this is like a long chain that um, just contain every amino acid has a bunch of little atoms. Not going to go into details in here. But what happens is this very long chain, when the atoms interact with each other, they make the proteins to fold. So folding, they, they start getting into different shapes. And once they're folded, they can be there for a little bit, and they unfold and fold again. So basically, they go, if you can see my, my pointer over here, my mouse, they go into a very high dimensional landscape. So they go into specific conformation. This is called a conformation. So they go into a one conformation, they unfold, they go into another. They may go to another local minimum and just jump around in this landscape. 
So depending on what specific conformation they are, is also the type of function that the protein may be doing. They may be enabling or, or not a particular pathway and maybe serve to uh, stop disease in, in one particular case or promote disease in another case, that kind of things. Uh, to give you an analogy, I really like this analogy of proteins just to give you a, an idea of what is the structure that we are dealing with. We have the primary structure that is just this long chain of amino acids. You can think of that as the alphabet, just the letters of the alphabet. Then we have secondary structures that are, they could be like little helices, they could be like pleated uh, structures. You can think of them as the words. So how those uh, letters in the alphabet start getting together to form meaning, in this case, kind of words. Tertiary structure is uh, similar to sentences, is how those secondary structure arrange with respect to each other to form the sentences. Then quaternary structure is how different proteins or different structures interact with each other to form paragraphs. In this, I'm going to be focusing on secondary structure and tertiary structure. So this, the tertiary structure especially determines the function of the protein. And it's very important for us to be able to understand that part. How do we do analysis of proteins nowadays? Well, a lot of it is done by homology. Like for example, let's say you have one protein and you want to figure out what is the function of that protein. Well, you go into a very big database and you try to find out other proteins that may be similar in, in this uh, tertiary structure to this other protein. And you could be even just finding parts of the structure that is similar to other proteins. And with that, you start inferring the function of the proteins. Now, as you can imagine, this is a very computationally expensive problem because the proteins are 3D objects. To figure out to whom they are close enough, you need to do what is called as 3D graph matching, which is an MP problem. So it's very computationally expensive. And then you, you don't need to do just general 3D graph matching, but also partial 3D graph matching, which makes this even, even more computationally expensive. But this is not going to scale. So usually what you will have is a bottleneck. So we are able to perform all of our simulations in parallel, but then the analysis is centralized. So that's a bottleneck because we are basically wasting all of the resources that we have. We cannot do this analysis in parallel because of the inherent uh, restrictions of this type of analysis. So what we say is, well, let's rethink the problem. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do something like uh, image pattern recognition, just as what we do in computer vision. Wouldn't it be nice that we could do something like that with the proteins? Well, you can see in this, in this slide, I'm just showing you the secondary structures of the proteins. So these are like uh, the helical domains in, in cyan. We have coils or loops over here. We have beta sheets over here. And they kind of are patterns. And the way in which they arrange, we can think of that as a little bit of the problem of, of image uh, recog pattern recognition. Now, the problem is that proteins are 3D objects. The way in which we are seeing this protein is going to change if we rotate the protein. So this representation is not good enough to translate that to the type of problem that we are interested in. So the thing is, and I promise I'm not going in details in here, but we changed the representation of our proteins. What we did is to preserve the secondary structure of the proteins over here. Again, not going in details, but I can explain that later. But we, we preserve the secondary structure and we preserve the tertiary structure and put them together in an image. So basically what we are doing is making the color of the image being the secondary structure and the intensity of the pixels being the tertiary structure. And now it's an image that we can actually analyze very, very easily. So again, I was saying just every channel in the image represents a secondary type of structure and the intensity represents the tertiary. So if we have this protein over here, we can start very easily finding, for example, the helical structures. You can see them in the diagonal over here in red. 
These are the two helices. You can see A2. This is this one. We can see the beta sheets that are these blue ones over here. You can see them also around the diagonal in blue. We can see the loops, the coils in red. We can see them as the intersections that are here in red and yellow, I mean, in green and yellow, sorry. And then we can see the interaction of each structure with each other in every part of the diagonal. Like for example, this part over here is how this helical domain interacts with this other helical domain. And so it's very easy for our scientists to be able to visualize what's going on with the protein. It just requires a little bit of training, but it's even easier for the computers now to analyze our proteins with this representation rather than with this three-dimensional representation that we had before. Now, instead of having to have every node having 50 gigabytes in RAM to be able to analyze a specific conformation, we can just train a small neural network and pass our encoding through that and we just need something like 70 megabytes. And in a couple of seconds in commodity hardware, we can get an, an answer on whether what kind of function this particular structure is having, which is orders of magnitude faster and with less memory than what other techniques are doing. So now what we are doing is what is called in situ analysis. We have in our CPUs, we are performing our simulations, and we can perform the analysis right there before the data is sent to secondary storage. So it becomes quite fast. We don't need to wait until all of the trajectories are done. We can just, as we produce data, we analyze the data, and at the end, we end up with a global view of all of our data, but in a much more efficient way. So you can see how the data representation is not only giving us um, it's giving us a lot of power in terms of the scalability of the problem. We can also quantitatively analyze when a particular conformation goes into one state or another by just having very lightweight models that we plug in into this, into this analysis. But beyond that, what is more relevant for this data representation is that it also allows us to give concrete explanations to our scientists on what's going on, why our models are predicting what they are predicting, what is what they want to know, right? They don't want black boxes. So let me give you this example. This is an opsin protein, and we have seven um, in, intermembrane helical domains. So if you can imagine, this is a membrane of a, of a, of a, of a cell, for example, and we have all of these helices going from one side of the membrane to another. So this part is called the extracellular part of the opsin, and this part over here is in the cytoplasm. What our scientists observe is that when something binds in this area of the protein, there is a reaction in the cytoplasm part of the, of the protein. This part starts to unravel. If we look at the representation of this protein with our encoding, you can see the seven helical domains are these seven segments in red that are along the diagonal. In the middle of the segments are the loops. So all of these loops are these parts over here that are, you can see in blue and yellow here in the middle. This particular one is this loop in red that they are very interested in. And then the interaction of them you can see them off the diagonal. For example, this loop interacts with this loop in this area of the image, if you can follow my cursor. So that's important because then when we perform the simulations, we want to be looking at those areas. We can, for example, see the unraveling of this loop by looking how this yellow, for example, starts taking over the set of the image. So these are different frames of the simulation at different points in time. And we can observe when that phenomenon happens very, very quickly without having to do any, any expensive computation. Now, if we pass this through our neural, neural network to try to determine function, it's also very interesting because now we can see what the neural network is looking at exactly in our images. For example, in this part, uh, what, what they are expecting to see is when something binds, then there is going to be an outward movement in the loop. And the loop that we are looking at is this loop over here, but we looked at, at the interaction of this loop over here with respect to this loop over here. So we are looking at this area. 
when something happens in this area is when this outward movement is happening. And this is what the neural network is predicting at one point in time, is saying this area over here that you can see these two areas are the ones that are the most relevant at this point in time. And at this point, there is no outward movement in the frame. But when we continue the simulation, at the moment where the outward movement is detected, now we see the neural network looking at this part of the image. So we can very confidently tell our scientists, yes, look, our neural network is actually looking at the area that you are interested in. So it's learning the kind of functions that you are really interested in and not something esoteric that we cannot explain. So that's very important. So with our encoding, we are not able just to make things faster and more scalable, but also more explainable. This is another protein. I just wanted to show you a different type of encoding for this protein. We can see uh, three uh, polypeptide units that are identical, and you can see them in the encoding here in the diagonal. And in this case, what we're interested in is what they call a, an elevator movement. This is also an, an intermembrane protein that is transporting uh, substrates from one side of the membrane to another. So they are interested in, in these things acting as elevators. And that we can see as the interaction of each one of these units with respect to each other. This is a movie of that. We don't have to go through the movie and wait until, until we see that movement happen in over here. But when we analyze the intensities of our encoding, we can see when that specific motion happens. And well, our scientists were super uh, excited that we were able to capture all of that in real time. We don't really need to do any very expensive computation. This is something that is super efficient to, to calculate. So the key takeaway for this part is just that data representation matters. So unless you have very huge data sets and endless compute power, your data representation is going to impact the quality of your models. And a good data representation can enable or hinder your scalability and interpretability. OK, so the last example, and I still have time. I'll go through this one in five minutes, I promise. So this one is about trust is what happens when we have bias in the data and bias in the models. This is work by my student, Esteban Guillén, in collaboration with Matthew Kane, Steve Tanberg, and Melissa Fang. So many times, uh, I, I like a quote, and I'm not sure who said that, but it's something like, if you torture the data long enough, it's going to confess to anything. And it's true. Uh, and that is something that happens a lot in research. You try something, it doesn't work. You try something else, it doesn't work. You try something else, and eventually it works. And it's like, why does it work? And the answer is many times, I don't know. Well, it works just because you really tortured the, your data or your models so much that you are making your, your models to learn something that may or may not be what you are intending them to learn. And that's a very difficult problem in medicine again. So this, this uh, set of, uh, this, this case that I'm going to show you is in the context of medical, medical analysis, in particular forensic reports, the first part. So in forensic reports, and, and I'm sorry to go into this theme so early in the morning, but basically we were analyzing autopsy reports. So we had a, a text of the reports that the coroner, the medical investigator writes. It contained microscopy comments that was uh, the type of injuries that the person had. It had information about toxicology. It had information about the scene in which the body was found, um, information about um, ethnicity and other personal information about the, the deceased. Um, person. So we were trying to analyze this because our, our partners at OMI wanted to know if a computer was going to be able to come up with a model to identify cause and manner of death. Uh, we say, yeah, probably can do that. So we, this is just a visualization of a medical report with the different type of injuries of the body. This is another example. Just moving on because I don't want you to look at too much into those. But what we did was a systematic analysis of what happens when we provide the neural network with more or less information. What are they going to be looking at? These are three models. 
for the same for the same person and you can see in some cases they were able to focus on the type of injuries so they were looking at the place of the injury at the at the type of injury in some cases they went straight away and look at race they were looking at whether they have a girlfriend, whether they were white, whether they were like all those things that you know are are probably ethically problematic for an AI to be focusing on that kind of things and for researchers to use models that are actually looking at that kind of things instead of looking at the real uh, potential indicators of what type of what type of death was this so look at the injuries look at the context like for example whether they were using uh, uh i forgot the name uh as a uh, seat belt that kind of thing so the neural networks if you leave them unchecked they went right away for race for for gender for all these kind of things that you know is in the real life, they are not they are not the indicators of what type of manner of death. It's just an indicator of the sampling of our data for these circumstances. So that's problematic. But what I want to say is very important that we look into this because if you just look at accuracy, you can very well be using a model that is looking at very biased view of the data. Uh, my students, Devon, also was doing work with the radiology department, looking at fractures in, in radiographs. He was looking at uh, fractures of femur, hip, and pelvis, and he was trying several, several architectures, several neural network architectures. And if you just look at accuracies, again, you can see, oh, well, these two models are very similar to each other. These two models are very similar to each other. But then when you look at what the networks were actually learning, we can have this experiment, experiment one. We have that the fracture was happening over here. You can see we have BGG, ResNet, and DenseNet in these three images. And again, the accuracy said that ResNet and DenseNet were very similar in terms of accuracy. Here you can see BGG focusing on, on parts that are not really relevant to the fracture. ResNet, you see it in yellow, actually in yellow and, and white are the areas where the neural network is really looking. We are looking at the activation maps. We are looking at where the neural network is actually paying attention to make a decision in terms of the classification of those images. You can see this one is a lot closer to the, to the actual fracture. And this one, even though it had very similar accuracy, you can see it is kind of confused all around the figure. So it's looking even at these tiny little marks of the radiographs, it's looking more at the muscle, muscle tissue rather than just the fracture. So these two models, even though in accuracy seem to be very similar, this one has higher quality because it's actually looking at the areas that we're interested versus this one that is probably overfitting to other factors that make it may have good accuracy but really bad interpretability is really not looking at the areas that a medical doctor will be will be also looking when we look at experiment two they improve quite a bit but in this one they're still looking very very bad at things that are just overfitting the image artifacts in the image and not really just the fracture this one now DenseNet, you can see are, again the ones that are very similar, DenseNet and ResNet. This one is looking now at the fracture, but it's also looking a lot at the nails. This one, ResNet, is looking at the fracture and it actually learned to occlude the part of the nail. So it's telling you this is not actually the relevant area. Don't look at it. In blue, you can see the parts that where the network is saying, don't really look at that part. So in this case, even though in accuracy, they are very similar, the model quality is again very different. This one has more quality because it's actually looking at the parts of the fracture that we're interested and is trying to avoid areas that are just going to be there to make the model overfit. The key takeaway is question your data and question your models. When it comes to trust, the traditional metrics of success like accuracy, precision, recall, specificity, etc., are just not enough. If we are looking at scientific applications, we need to demystify the black box. 
it needs to become a cultural norm to try to question both our data and our models so that we can actually get to trust them. Otherwise, we are going to be just learning functions that we don't even know if they are true or not. Okay, so I think I made it in time, okay? That these are some references of some of the work that I show. Um, I want to thank especially to my group. This is an old picture. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to take a new one. Uh, several of my students are not in this picture, but they are the ones doing the work. They are the ones actually doing everything happen. So thank you to my lab, to our sponsors, and of course, to our collaborators and partners. And um, before I go a little bit of um, a little bit of marketing, we are hosting a virtual work cafe on robust science. This is a work in collaboration with Michaela Taufer, Eva Delman, Mary Hall, and Victoria Student, and Rafael Ferreira da Silva. This is the link for that workshop is on Wednesday, August 25th. And it's all of about this type of issues that we see and how do we keep our science robust in in not only in terms of AI, but we also look at other issues like workflows and system management and other things. So this is our link. And that's it from my side. Made it 45 minutes exactly. And thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. And there is something in the chat. I'm sorry, I didn't see that because I was in uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. full screen. <laughs> Thank, thank you so much, Trilce. That was a phenomenal presentation. Um, it was it was really good, and I think everyone really enjoyed it. Um, there was one question here from Maggie in the chat. Um, have you successfully used this model for prediction structure interaction and responses? Um, and she was referring to the protein structure and functional model. Yeah, yeah, we, we actually do that. We, we apply it to function of proteins and the accuracy, I don't have the paper with me, but it was a very good accuracy. I think it was in the 80, 80%, 80 something along those lines, but it was several thousand proteins and very, very different from, from very different uh, organisms and from different types of functions. So these were all based on EMs, electron micrographs, and, and other types of uh, sort of static pictures of proteins. Mostly, so for the for the training of our of our methods, we use structures that had been crystallized already. So we did encoding and then we did the training. But then for the function predictions, we base that on molecular dynamics. So they were simulations and they were in very different in very different. Uh, um, positions and we also did a traditional split of validation for the when we did the training and validation of proteins. Okay, good. I'll come and talk to you about this. It's uh, an area that I was working in, bef you know, before I retired from UNM. Awesome. Thank you. And my student actually is, is also put he put the, the link to the paper in, in the chat also. If you're oh yeah, interested. yeah. Oh, I see. Great. Yeah, I'll send you some other papers uh, you might find interesting. Yeah, thank you. And uh, this is Michael. Um, I actually have a question too, as well. Um, there are obviously different types of applications for the machine learning. And I know that in a lot of these, which are very, very important, they're, for lack of a better word, static. Um, analysis, you know, you're looking at pictures, radiographs, you know, proteins, you know, those types of things. Um, is there a different type of structure, and you don't have to go into big detail, um, when you're talking about real-time things? Like, I know there's a lot of, you know, real-time face recognition, obviously self-driving cars and, and detection and all those things are becoming, you know, a, a huge endeavor. And so, um, does that have a, a different approach and, and change on how those things are doing, especially since in real time, you really get a lot of external unknowns, um, you know, whether you want to call it chaos or randomness or whatever, <laughs> whatever term you want to use um, with that, the, the, the unpredictable factor and the things that aren't normally there, <laughs> a bird, you know, a, a 
cardboard box flying through the air, uh, you know, whatever that you couldn't have trained or predict predicted for. Um, so I'm curious how if you if you have any you know uh, quick little little talk about how that realm goes down as well too. Yeah, it's very interesting that you bring that up. Many of our problems that we are really interested in are real time or stream analysis. So is those things where you just get data and you do, you cannot wait to build big models to analyze them, but you just get the data once and you try to make an analysis as fast as possible so that you learn from that. We have been using that for a, for the proteins that I was showing you in situ analysis, but also for social media. So we are looking at um, lots and lots and lots of tweets so we cannot just get all that and store it and try to analyze it later right so we need to form graphs of for example how the communities are forming and what are they saying at that point in time because maybe there is something exploding over here in the in the social media world and we want to know what that's happening and that of course nobody can predict what is going to be the next big scandal tomorrow right so the way in which we represent and analyze those kind of problems, yeah, is is very very different. One of my students was doing analysis of drones. She was trying to find whether there were drones or there were birds, and so many times what we do is we try to learn for the common case. We try to learn very well what you already know, so that when there is uncertainty, that's when the models react. And maybe you need to build something else to try to compensate for this new thing, this unknown. But many times is what we call is this an anomaly. Is this something that behaves like the normal things in the world that we have seen, or is this something that behaves as something else? And that's why the whole the whole issue of sampling bias is very important. If you train your data, your models with a very reduced set of data then they are not going to be able to generalize well to this unknown because everything is going to be basically unknown. So, so yeah, basically what we try to do is learn the things that are very well understood well at first and then try to plan for what is uncertain. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. So it's not like... Thank you for that answer. Uh, we have another question here as well. Um, was the transformation of the protein images based on any single value decomposition of the image or was the transformation purely guided by the content slash type of the image uh, input images? So we didn't do any sort of decomposition. Uh, the first approach we try actually was doing, we were doing the comp uh, we, we were doing matrix decomposition of the images, but that didn't work very well. So it, it is based on the secondary structure. So we look at all these helices, basically look at the angles in which the amino acids connect with each other to try to say, okay, this looks more like a helix or no, this looks like a planar structure. And all of that goes into the secondary structure that is the color of the images. And then we look at how the different atoms uh, are um, correlate with each other in space. That's like we, we make like a distance matrix of all of the atoms and that's the tertiary structure. So we combine those two things into the three channels. So it's basically static to, to some degree, but we are not doing the compositions because that will require us to have all of those, all of the, all of the proteins that relate to one thing to be able to come with a decomposition that makes sense. And that's what we were trying to avoid. We were trying to avoid to have to collect all of the data at once because we wanted to do the in-situ analysis. So we want to be able to as new data comes, we have a representation that doesn't depend on anybody else. Thank you. And one one last question. I apologize. I have a few questions. Uh, you know, on these. Um, there was obviously a recently somewhat well known, you know, image of a black hole, um, and I know a lot of times in astronomy, they they'll take data sets from different telescopes, sometimes huge differences in resolution, some from telescopes 20 or 30 or 50 years ago, some from modern day, you know, some from Hubble, all these things, and they take disparate, um, you know, compilations and run analysis, generate images, put things together. And so you kind of talked about this a little bit, but um, uh, that, like you said, a lot of people like to 
run AI by trying to homogenize or manipulate the data versus taking data that's a huge, huge differential and actually being able to correlate it and make sense of it. And that correlation factor, being able to stitch together disparate parts of data, do you see that as really a lot more of where the, the, the field is heading um, given that that's the needed direction? Um, the, the quick answer is I don't know. Like, honestly, it's, uh, it's just so many people out there trying different approaches. And I don't, I, I wouldn't even be able to tell you what is the right direction to go in that sense. But what I know is regardless of what they do, they need to be able to come up with a credible explanation of why the AI did what it did. So if, if they can pass this part, then you can look back and figure out if the method work or not. But the short answer is, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, in, in every discipline, sometimes things make sense in chemistry and that don't make sense in biology and that may not make sense in astrophysics. So it, um, it is just really problem dependent, that kind of, that kind of des design decisions. Well, thank you for that answer. And um, I don't see anything more in the chat. Did anyone else have any other questions? Um, yeah, Michael, this is Tony. I, I do have one. And sure. I, by the way, put it in the chat. Um, given what you've described, Chelsea, uh, when do you think we'll have some more general purpose, maybe generally available tool for validating the conclusions an AI reaches without having to run a research project each time? Um, I think that's where the field is trying to move on, you know, uh, many times, I mean, and in these workshops that we, I was just promoting before, we talk about what is the advantage of having something that is very general purpose, especially in science versus something that is just straight to the problem and try to do that problem well. There is no consensus between our scientists because, yeah, sometimes you need something that is like, easy to deploy. And then if you need to look into the specifics of the problem, it can become like years. While if you have a prototype that is more general purpose, then you can come up with conclusions that are faster, but they may not be as precise or as accurate. So I think there is a trade-off in, in that sense. There is always going to be a trade-off. If you do something very sp specific for a particular problem, is very likely to work better, but then it's going to require a lot of engineering and a lot of thought and a lot of customization. While if you do something that is very general, it may get you halfway there, but probably not all the way there, depending on the problem. So it's a trade-off. And I think there is space for both. You can do preliminary type of analysis with something that is very general purpose and then go from there and do something more specific. And in that way, you kind of optimize the whole pipeline. But I think uh, the field is trying to come up with those solutions. Um, probably still going to take a little bit of time, but I do think there is a lot of research in, in that space, trying to advance these kind of problems. Thank you. And I want to thank you again for such a wonderful presentation um, on behalf of the Big Data Peer Group and the New Mexico Technology Council. I'd like to thank everyone for joining as well. Um, Emily posted in the chat a link if you want to join the mailing list for our talks. And of course, if you want any other information on the New Mexico Technology Council or to join. Thank you again, Chelsea. And, uh, and Michael. You Michael, real quick before we wrap sure. up, um, sure. um, one of our students actually put a comment in the chat or a question as well. Um, oh. So Vivian said, great presentation. Melanie Mitchell gave a talk at UNM in 2018 where she believes in order to better understand black box, we must get back to our roots and exchange um, more ideas with cognitive research and living brains. 
How do you feel about taking the approach of applying behavioral cognitive research such as spatial navigation and rodents? I think that's a, that's a very interesting aspect. Machine learning, sometimes we think of machine learning or artificial intelligence as something that is actually knowing or understanding something of the world versus something that is just taking a bunch of statistics and making predictions that kind of work. Uh, those are two worlds apart that we do need to come up with a way of reconciling. A subgroup of my group is actually very interested in the workings of the brain and how do we translate that into our model so that we can actually start understanding rather than just interpreting uh, statistics. But yeah, hopefully we're going to go there. That's the dream, right? That's the dream of anybody doing artificial intelligence to be able to get to that, to that uh, merging of the two worlds probably still is still not we are not close to that but we're going we're going there when the human thinks about doing something we eventually reach to that probably in 200 or 300 years we are going to have real artificial intelligence that learns something in in a way that is more more typical to, to humans and more typical of how the brain does it so thank you very much for inviting me it was a pleasure Look forward to hearing more about the group. Terrific. Well, Trilce, thank you so much for joining us and for a great presentation. We're getting lots of comments in the chat about how everyone really enjoyed it. And thank you so much for your time. And thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Have a great day.